to my series of lectures on multicultural communication. My name is Dr. Marquita Bird, aka Dr. B, as my students call me, and I'm happy you're here with me today. I am uh, talking about multicultural communication for two reasons. The first is to help us understand more about our diverse society. America is is a, a diverse society and a hope and always has been. But in the 21st century, there's a lot of changes coming and it makes some people uncomfortable. So I'm hoping that these discussions can help us to be more comfortable with multicultural communication. Secondly, I like for us to gain uh, skills and knowledge that will help us to be better communicators. Any community works better if the people who are in the community can talk to each other in ways that are not threatening, that are supportive, and that benefits the entire community and nation. So today we're going to talk about a specific topic that not many people hear about, and that topic is isms. And you may be thinking, what are, what are isms? Let's spell it first. I-S-M apostrophe S. Isms. And isms have to do with uh, things that we say or do that promote discrimination, reduce social justice, and limit the potential of ourselves and others. Isms. Isms are uh, present among all of us, not just some of us, and we're all guilty of uh, buying into those every now and then. So let's talk about specifically how we would define an ism. Isms have to do with attitudes, or practices, or systems, or even philosophies that generate discrimination. Attitudes, practices, systems, or philosophies. For uh, And these uh, attitudes can lead to exclusion of certain individuals or groups, and it certainly can uh, lead to a reduction in social justice. For some people, social justice is a dirty concept. They don't like it. But social justice simply means that we are in a society where people are uh, receiving the resources, have access to, are included, uh, regard regardless of race, color, creed, etc., and so forth. Social justice. Social justice means that we, most of us, get what we need and a lot of what we want without disparity. That's social justice. Let's give some examples. Here, here's the examples. Here's the labels that you will hear people use when they're talking about isms. One, racism. That's the first thing people think about. And that means discriminating against people because of their race. Ethnocentrism, and many of us suffer from this. Ethnocentrism is when you think that your ethnicity is superior to other people's ethnicity. Sexism. Sexism is when you discriminate against somebody uh, are people based on the gender uh, that they are. Uh, classism is when you discriminate against people because of the social economic level that they belong to. Here's a new one, queer, queer negativity. When I use the word queer, I'm not using it in a derogatory term. I'm using it in the political sense. Queer simply means people who don't conform to the uh, standard a heterosexual a way of life. Queer can include gays, lesbian, transgender, asexual, bisexual, and so forth and so on. Queer is a political term, and you really shouldn't call someone that unless you know them well enough they may uh, be uh, assaulted by it. Ableism. I'm particularly uh, versed with ableism. Ableism is the belief that there's something wrong with people who don't have the same abilities or resources that we have to live their daily life. Ableism is when we create a world that is uh, designed for only people who can walk and talk, et cetera, and so forth. Ageism is, of course, discrimination against people of a particular age group. We always believe talk about the elderly and the seniors, but the fact is that there's youth discrimination. There's discrimination against youth. There's discrimination against children. So age discrimination goes everywhere. And then there's religious intolerance. Religious intolerance, we're very familiar with that as we move through the 21st century. That's when we discriminate against people based on their religious beliefs uh, and practices. My second point is that we need to talk about the harm of isms. You may say to yourself, well, so what? 
the harms of ism. Uh, they first deny re the rights of others and ultimately yourself. Uh, it reduces the resources that we have available and it reduces access to people or individuals or even organizations based on their membership in a group. For example, if you have an organization that doesn't allow, uh, that, that doesn't promote uh, the, the speaking of all people in the organization, then that organization loses access to certain information because everybody doesn't have the same information. We often see people who are middle-aged don't want to hear from young people because they'll say, well, they don't know anything. Sometimes I will think that about my students, and I have to correct myself and say, yes, they know something. We just don't know the same thing, and it's important for me to figure out. So it denies uh, res uh, rights and resources, uh, and it also cuts off access to information. Uh, it fails to recognize the individual. So, we, you know, we don't meet all of the people who are handicapped. We don't meet all of the people of a particular religion. We meet one person, two people, but we categorize them all and then discriminate against them all, regardless of who they are. Uh, and so that is the harm. That's the harm, that uh, not all of us are included. And when you leave people out, you lose resources and information. So it hurts all of us. Now, the big question, point three, is who engages in isms? Now, often when I give this lecture for uh, groups who are studying diversity, they start out thinking, well, it's the dominant, power dominant people who do this. It's the white people who do it. That's what you always want to hear is the white people who do it. The fact is that every single group, all individuals engage in the isms. And that's a shock to everybody. And they may engage in the isms toward people who are outside of their group and then also inside their group. And let's talk about that. That's a very interesting idea. So I want to start out with the, the, the idea that it's not just the power uh, dominant people. Um, for example, within African Americans, uh, sometimes we discriminate against each, each other based on skin color. And that is called colorism. And we discriminate against each other because of the straightness or curliness of our hair. There are people who don't like their own people. For example, I know Mexican people who don't like Mexicans. I know white people who don't like whites. I know blacks who don't li like blacks. I have Filipinos. How do I know this? Because I know people who told me this. I know people who discuss this. And so these things actually exist. So that's internalized isms. That's internalized racism, internalized sexism. There are women who don't like other women. There are men who don't like other men. That means you've internalized the ism and, and, and then project that out to other people, which is extremely dangerous. I'll give an example. My father, uh, my dad, who's passed away now, uh, we had a very difficult time getting him to go to a senior housing. And the reason that he didn't want to go there is because he didn't like old people. Now, he was 75, but he didn't like old people. He didn't want to be around old people. If I took him somewhere and I, you know, wanted to take him to a group that was his age, oh, I want to be over there with those old people. Uh, so he discriminated against senior citizens. A woman who uh, was a minister uh, for me in uh, past years uh, admitted to me that she didn't like white people. And what she said was, I never uh, imagined that white people could suffer until I went to a veterans convention and saw all the elder white veterans who were suffering. And you see how dangerous that is if you can't empathize because of the isms. And as I said, I, I, my, I have neighbors who told me they don't like Mexicans and they're Mexican. So that's, in turn, that's when you internalize the ism and you turn it toward yourself and you turn it toward the people who are in the group. So it's not just the power dominant, it's not just white people who engage in these isms. Uh, I have students here in this community where we have highly diverse uh, population in the schools. I've had white students who are going to predominantly brown high schools, and they talk about the discrimination that they experience as a white person in that community. And it's just as damaging as having a, a, a brown person uh, have to experience that in a white uh, community. Uh, so uh, we need to be aware of that. I also know people who are disabled but don't like disabled people. So uh, I, I, my whole point here 
is that it's it's not it doesn't happen just in the power dominant it doesn't happen just in white people it happens in all of us even myself i have to catch myself when i'm thinking about things oh those people do so and so that is racist and i need to be aware that i'm thinking that and we always have to check our own bias and i like to admit on this show that uh, i i have bias uh and um i have to always guard against that so uh Isms are very dangerous because they are, um, cause us to discriminate against people. So you may be asking yourself, what do we do about it? Isms are there. They will always be there in, their, in every society. I don't care what people tell you. They'll say, oh, uh, we don't have any racism. I've heard Africans say that. I've heard Hawaiians say that. I've heard all sorts of people say that. And that's not true. We always have the wisdoms, isms there. Uh, most often about race, gender, class. Those are the three biggies. Uh, and I, um, uh, people tend to think, for example, that people who have money are on, the only people who discriminate on the basis of class. However, a few years ago, I belonged to a church and we combined with another church. Uh, my church, uh, the, the congregation was basically educated middle class African Americans. We had teachers, lawyers, engineers, uh, social workers, probation officers, uh, all sorts of people there. And when we knew this other congregation was coming in, we were excited. They were coming from a very urban area where there was a, a lot of deprivation uh, in the society materially. So we op we opened our arms to them. Uh, we welcomed them in. We did things to recognize uh, and include. However, they had uh, negative attitudes toward us. And we would hear things like, well, they don't know how to worship. They don't know how to sing, you know, those gospel songs. We're going to teach them how to sing them. Uh, and, and that hurt. That hurt. And there was nothing we could do to o overcome it. Also, many of us offered to help the children. There are a lot of children who came with them. And they maybe not have the, the clothes that they needed. Uh, somebody was pregnant and needed uh, things. So, we didn't get up in service and offer help. We would go to the mother individually and say, well, is there anything I can do for such and such a child? And they would always say, no, we don't need anything. So that's classism uh, backwards. And lastly, in college towns, university towns, where it's a, there's a divide between, between the town and the gowns, they call it the towns and the gowns. And the gowns are the people who teach at the university. I live in one community where it was a predominantly uh, African-American area. I taught at a predominantly white school and several of us did. And so we wanted to be involved in the neighborhood and help with our knowledge, but we were always rebuffed uh, because we were college professors. And the people thought, well, you know, they're going to try to take over the organization and they want all the power. And uh, so they would rebuff us in the organization. So it's, it's not just the people at the top uh, of the hierarchy, also people who are unfortunately at the bottom of the hierarchy who may discriminate. So we talked about two points in terms of isms and discriminatory attitudes, and we talked about, we've had a definition of isms, and now we've talked about the harm of isms, and also we talked about who uses these isms. And I think a very important point to leave this with is they can be between groups, uh, and it can be within groups. And with it's with, within groups, it means that a person has internalized racism, internalized sexism, uh, internalized uh, queerness, uh, 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 negativity, so that they don't want to interact with people in their own group. Uh, and of course, that's extremely dangerous. As I told my friend who, my white minister, when she said she didn't like white people, I said, well, you can't be healthy cannot be emotionally healthy if you don't like the people uh, where you come from. That's, that's, your, that's part of your identity. And to not see any good in the community where you come from is, is, is debilitating. Like we would give out gifts at, at church and uh, we give, gave out pens one time, uh, brooches that we had made. And most of them, all of them were black except the one we gave to her, which was a white woman. And she gave it back. She didn't want that. I don't want this. <laughs> you know, uh, so we have to be very careful about internalized. Internalized racism keeps you from uh, getting your your potential. 
if you if you internalize racism against your race, then it hurts you and and it makes you not be able to attain. Uh, well, black people can't do this. Or, you know, uh, I'm white. Uh, I can't have culture. Uh, we get all those sorts of things. Uh, I'm a woman, and I'm not worthy. The internalized isms kill. My uh, fourth point is, uh, I, you may be saying, okay, so it happens. What can I do about it? This is the key. This is the key to multicultural uh, wellness and wholeness. What can you do about it? Number one, recognize the isms in yourself. Uh, don't project and say that exists in all other people. Recognize it in yourself. For example, I hear you know uh, people of color say, well, white people can't dance. That's an ism. White people can dance. All human beings dance. They may like not dance like you do, but they are dancing. So those sorts of things. Uh, there was a movie, White Men Can't Jump. Uh, wow. Uh, that was racist. Uh, of course, we know white men can jump. Uh, so recognize it in yourself first. And I remember the first time I came to San Jose to visit my parents, which was in the 70s. Uh, my mother came here from the Midwest and the South. So, man, her conversation would be all about Mexicans can't do this and Mexicans do that. Very, very negative. And after a while, I just got so tired of it. And I said to her, do you realize that you are talking about Mexicans like the power dominant have talked about blacks? You don't like it. And it's not right for you to do it with someone else to make those generalizations. Uh, so recognize it in yourself first and then recognize it in others. The second thing is to realize that the person who is engaged in these isms may not be aware that they are. People don't, you know, we always think, well, they know what they're doing. Not necessarily so, because isms can come from uh, habit. Uh, they can come from how you were raised. They can come from defensiveness. They can come from fear. And so they may not understand the, the, the racism. Uh, and so you need to be aware of that. Don't jump to conclusions. That's very important. Second thing, you're going to have to decide how you want to respond to the ism. Uh, so you understand it. Uh, the person may not be aware. And then you think, well, what should I do about this or should I do anything? We know from a study from Harvard Public Education that uh, people of color who respond to the isms tend to be more healthy physically and emotionally than people who don't. Women who are discriminated against, children, etc., and so forth. Well, we don't let children respond because then they get smacked for being smart. But um, we need to determine if the harm harmful effects are worth responding to. You can't fight every battle. You cannot respond to every uh, uh, um Ism. So is it important enough for me to say something about it? Um, then in public, you may say to the person without hostility and anger uh, that this thing that they've done is racist or sexist or religious uh, intolerance, those sorts of things. You have to say that first, call them out, and then describe what they said. Don't assume that, oh, they know what they said. Maybe not. So you describe what they said. Uh, for example, I used to go to this fast food place and they got a new manager. And so the new manager will always refer to women clients as honey or hun. And so the first time I went there, I spoke to him privately and said, hun or honey is a intimate word. And that's a word that you will only use with your child or your lover, um, somebody that you know well. This is a public place. You don't know me. So don't refer to me as honey. And so I, you know, I said, told, I spoke to him about what he said. I identified it as an insult, and I uh, told them how I feel. When you call me honey, that I feel like you're trying to diminish me, uh, to treat me as a child or an intimate. And then I said, I hope the next time I come, you won't do that. You ask them not to do it again. This takes thinking, and it takes emotional control. I felt that it was important because I go, I went to that place a lot and I didn't want to be angry every time I left. So the next time I went again, uh, that first time I said it from my, my car. 
which is, uh, you know, I'm sitting low, he's sitting up. The next time I went in there to get something, and again, he referred to me as honey. So that time I was able to say to him again, I was here last week and I, I asked you not to do that. Call me honey or anybody because it's, um, it's, it dim diminishes people and I hope you don't do it again. So then he explained. He said, well, uh, I called, went, I, I thought that was being friendly um, uh, to women. And so I s was able to say, no, that's not friendly. That's, that's the diminishing. So next time I went, he didn't do it anymore. Now, I don't know if he still called other women honey, but he didn't call me honey. And, and that was the key. The last thing, uh, uh, well, the fourth thing is understand that the ism is not about you. This is the thing that kills people. When people are racist, people always think it's about them. It has nothing to do with you. When they're sexist, that it's about them. It's nothing to do with you. And once you think that it's about you, then you internalize it and you feel bad. And my notion was always, it's about the other person. The isms are about the other person. When I went to college, uh, I went to college in 68 to a predominantly white school. We were the largest class influx of in incoming uh, black students. And um, I had teachers who were very racist. I had teachers in class who would say, I don't think colored students should be here. I had teachers who wouldn't call on me. I was there for a whole semester, and they wouldn't call on me. Um, and, of course, I dealt with that by simply starting blurting out answers. And after I did that for a while, they knew, okay, we got to call on Marquita because she's going to say it anyway. Um, I, uh, so those sorts of things. Understand that it's not about you. And l lastly, don't let the ism stop you. Don't let it stop you. Don't say, well, these people are racist or they're sexist or they don't like my religion, what does that have to do with you? Don't let it stop you on your progress. Don't let it stop you from going where you need to go. So today I've talked about isms, which as you can see, I'm very emotional about. And um, if you wanna learn more, then you should go to the PowerPoint link at the bottom of the video and uh, see my PowerPoint and also some lecture notes. So um, thank you for being with me today. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture and learned a lot. Uh, join me at the next time, and I will leave you with the words of Mr. Spock from Star Trek, Live Long and Prosper.